feel quite so wobbly, you know. Dead bus sag anywhere. That starts, in some people's cases, in their teens. It just looked like you got boobs. I'm just being smart ass. Yo, 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 what's going on, guys? You're listening to the More Than Lifting podcast. I'm Reese. And I'm Chris. And uh, today we're going to be talking about low level drills and uh, movement fund fundamentals. Okay? So, uh, first off, Chris, everything all right? Yeah, everything's good, mate. Yeah, it's um, you know, been a bit of an up and down few days, but uh, generally uh, seeing the light now, so it's all good. How about yourself? Yeah, 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 I'm okay. Just been, just been cracking up. So, low level drills, movement fundamentals, we're talking about the basic movement processes and ways to think about your exercise um, with uh, body weight exercise because they're all mostly compound exercises you're not doing just isolated like bicep curls or something like that you're working multiple muscle groups or, to- or total body uh, exercises and stuff like that so it's not you, you don't need to think of things like oh I'm doing arms today oh I'm doing back today oh I'm doing shoulders today because you'll be doing them all in one exercise Okay, so that's basically what we're going to be talking about. Um, Yeah, so the way I think about it, Chris, the way a lot of people in the calisthenics community especially think about it is just breaking it into these fundamental movement types, uh, which are push exercises when you're extending something, uh, your limbs away from your body, pull exercises when you're bringing your uh, extremities in, and then uh, hold exercises where you're maintaining a static position, keeping solid. And uh, yeah, yeah, so that's really it. Yeah, See you for... next week. <laughs> <I'll catch laughs> yeah, I mean, just, just for, to give everyone an idea, um, when we sort of transfer that over to the sort of strength and conditioning community, you have push, you have pull, you will have, you know, hold isometric base loading, but that tends to be a parameter set for most exercises, i.e. every exercise has a, an isometric position Component. or capacity to it. So, you know, holding a press up, holding a pull up, holding a squat, holding even a deadlift or a hinge position. But the sort of primary movement patterns we talk about there are very much push, pull, squat, hinge, carry, twist. Occasionally, some people classify a lunge, uh, like any sort of single leg movement, you know, a step up is a lunge, a lunge obviously is a lunge, a split squat is, is a lunge or a squat position, depending on your perspective. So there are a variety of different movement patterns, but I think for the purposes of today, we'll keep it to the very sort of raw fundamentals, as you said. So the, the push, pull, the ISO holds, obviously very relevant to gymnastics, very specifically because that's something way beyond normal um, training parameters, you know, actually balancing yourself off the floor. It's not something you'd see people typically do in the gym. And we'll also look at some of the relevance of leg work, because I know something that does come up as a question around calisthenics and gymnastic strength a lot. Um, and obviously it's a huge part of the strength and conditioning world is leg work, you know, and how you can optimize that. And obviously if people are doing predominantly body weight based drills, then how do you maximize leg strength, you know, leg coordination, leg power and drive, you know, how does basically what does leg work look like in a gymnastics or a calisthenics setting? So maybe we can touch on that a little bit as well. But if you want to crack on with the upper body stuff and then we can move into that a bit later. Yeah, yeah, I think I think leg stuff can actually be really interesting with calisthenics and I think it is confusing because before everything you think about with your legs is like basically just a form of squatting or lunging like you're saying and uh, when you think about doing that as an exercise you always got something in your hands <laughs> you know what I mean you <laughs> yeah. always people always have something in their hands or on their shoulders but yeah so but yeah like you say we'll talk about that in a minute first off we'll talk about the the the, the two movements as opposed to the hold push and pull in and um, these really are the the fundamentals of movement if you think about any kind of any kind of thing you do it went in in any form of life you're either usually bringing something into your body or moving something away N- not necessarily from the total extreme from all the way over there to all the way in here and vice versa it's usually just little bits here and there but in all your muscles are literally work around hinges so th- they are the essential movements bringing something in moving something out so when you're doing uh, an, any exercise with calisthenics, it's good to have in your head to understand whether you're doing a pull movement or whether you're doing a push movement, because it's important to balance both of these um, these parts of the equation. Otherwise, you're going to have one part of one of your basic movement types is going to be really strong, and the other one's going to be weak. 
and no one wants that. That's half of your body uh, that's going to be out of balance with the other half of your body. And it's not going to be left and right, it's going to be your front and your back, which is a different way of looking at exercise but uh, to what is conventional, I guess. But, uh, but that's the issue that you'll have if you don't focus on those things. And we've all seen, you know, the guys who spend pretty much 90% of their time doing chest work, you know, benches, incline presses, pec flies, things like that, have very, what we call protracted shoulders, so very drawn in, rounded shoulders, you know, yeah. very tight pectoral, very tight anterior portion of their body. And obviously it's not being balanced out with the right ratios on the pulling side of things. Now, a lot of that come down, comes down to very poor partial technique on a lot of exercises. You know, you'll see the bench barely even come down lower than you know maybe a couple of inches once they've lifted it off of a bench press or you know their their inclined dumbbell press is very short you know the pec flies a very minimal range you know so they're getting very tight in very specific areas which create a very as i say protracted and kyphotic position with their body i.e they're rounded in their back and given that a lot of people nowadays are very desk bound with their work you know most people assume a very kyphotic posture anyway so they're very rounded already because they're spending all day hunched over a laptop so you then go into the gym and pound away on the chest even harder and tighten up an already very tight area and it's the same with abdominal flexion so doing crunches for example it's why you know forward crunches or upper body flexion you know through the torso is kind of frowned upon quite a lot in strength conditioning world because if you don't have a very strong posterior chain if you don't have a very good neutral posture then what you're going to find is that you're only compounding the tension in the muscles like the abdominals and the pectoral muscles and the anterior deltoids they're going to cause you to round your back even more so you're going to you go into the gym thinking you're moving around and ironing out some of the issues you've had from sitting down all day but in fact you're potentially making it worse and a lot of the time thinking in a ratio of about two to one of back to front exercises you know it's a good start point it's not the most accurate you could probably say 1.5 and obviously if you're doing pressing work and, and static holds particularly for the anterior portion of the body just even something as simple as maybe a plank or you know a dynamic plank which is a press up then you know if you're doing those things correctly and with good range that's a really healthy movement for the shoulders to go through it causes scapular uh, winging and, and um, retraction as well so the scapular muscle sorry the scapular bones your shoulder blades are opening up and moving around quite freely the shoulder girdle the shoulder joints moving very freely as well so you're getting a good range of motion so what's happening is those muscles and those joints through the press are getting opened up really really well so you don't have to go crazy with doing tons of back work to balance it out however if you do already have a very kyphotic very anteriorly dominant postural position then you're going to have to do a hell of a lot of pulling work to correct that first and then try and maintain a pretty strong ratio thereafter but um yeah just wanted to give you that little insight before we crack on no, no, that's really important. Like you, like you're saying, it's, it's like people are sitting slouching all day and then they're going to the gym and training into the slouch rather than trying to counter it and work the other parts of your body that are, that are being misaligned and, and are losing out from being in that position. So it's, it's, uh, it's a really important thing to raise so that you understand the importance of it and you, under you, have, you grasp the concept as well that... Um, Training isn't just to look good, like it's to, to fix your, your, your body, it's to give, not necessarily fix your body, but it's to... Um, realign. It's, yeah, realign and, and enable your, your body in the, the, the best way, get your, get your skeleton in the right place. Because we're all out of shape, we're all out of place, like no one... No, well, I mean, there are probably a, a handful of uh, athletes and stuff that are, really have perfect posture, but most people don't and uh, most people don't understand the importance of it either. It affects all kinds of things like your mood and stuff like that and how your hormones balance in your body. And I mean, it's so important that it's not just about having a big chest. It's about... <laughs> It's, it's a, sometimes no, about having a big chest, but it's not I mean, always. Sure, about. yeah, but that's a byproduct of <laughs> tr working on your your body as a whole, you know, as a unit. Because if you just have pecs, then you just look like you've got boobs. Yeah, true. Well, the thing is, it, it goes back to what we've talked about in, in prior couple of episodes, and what will continue to be a theme throughout every episode. I imagine it's you know, it's great to look good, and it's great to want to look good, but you can look good and function well you know, function fantastically well all at the same time. You know, it's possible, i.e. look at 
any gymnast out there. <laughs> you know, look at how well their body functions, look how strong it is. And, you know, those can be classified as extremes. And then you'll hear stories about, you know, how gymnasts' bodies break down in later life and they have various issues and they can't sustain the intensity that they're working at in their teens and their 20s through mm. to their 30s and 40s. And you're like, okay, fair enough, that's aging. You know, performance can likely diminish in most elite sports as people get older, whether it's yeah. football, basketball, tennis, golf, it doesn't really matter. You know, your performance can degrade over time, even with the best of intentions around your training. That's just the, the natural physiology we all have to kind of deal with as we get older. But, you know, the levels that we accept of degradation are just appalling. You know, it's like, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm old, you know. You know, we gave yeah, the example. I'm I think, old. That's not an excuse. Are you kidding me? Well, yeah, I think it was. I mean, I've given this example already. But, you know, the idea of someone in their 50s who accepts they can't lift their arms above their head. You know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the perfect example. It's like, well, I'm just getting older. It's like, no, you're not. You're just rubbish. You're just you're just forgetting. <laughs> just, you're just forgetting. <laughs> That's what it is. You, you, exactly. Your body's forgetting. Your joints are forgetting. Like and your your uh, your cells and your DNA is forgetting. Yeah, and, so, and shockingly, yeah. that that starts in some people's cases in their teens and into their twenties. You know, I see guys in their twenties. You know, who functionally uh, are in awful shape and it, it can be mm. corrected that's the great thing the sooner you start the easier it is to recorrect and and that's you know something that everyone should be encouraged by but yeah, you yeah. know start sooner rather than later to give yourself the best opportunity and also to enjoy the benefits of actually progressive training over time as well you know progressive effort movement you know just developing into you know a more natural functional human being and going back to what you said before you know balance is probably the, the most powerful word you can use there it gets overused a lot but rebalancing your body because it is all about ratios you know most injury most ailment most pain most stress you know it comes from imbalance in the body whether it's a hormonal imbalance but or a physiological balance but when we're talking about musculature and connective tissue and you know skeletal function then what we mean there is just trying to get the ratios correct you know because that's where most you know probably 99 if not 100 percent of injuries come from is that you go to do something and something's too tight or it's overly contracted or it's not been warmed up appropriately or there's too much torque in one part of the movement, one, one muscle versus, you know, the requisite amount of flexibility in the other and all of a sudden something snaps, something goes ping and yeah, it may be that you're pushing to something that you're not quite ready for yet and we've all been there, haven't we? You know, I mean, yeah. you've, you've been getting through some injuries recently. I've had a multitude of things in the past where I've just wanted to go a bit too hard and fast too soon and it's you know, it's found me out, you know, the strength yeah. wasn't there, the stability wasn't there, the, the mobility wasn't there. It wasn't because there was a huge imbalance, it was just a bit too much for me to do at the time. But I'm sure there have been other injuries that I sustained in the past when I didn't know what I know now that were due to imbalances. You know, I've not always been as flexible, as mobile, as strong as I currently am. And I'm hoping that, you know, as I actually continue to progress the training and make things harder on myself, because I'm doing the right work to balance that, then I'm going to get stronger without and actually have an even lower risk of, of injury long term. So, you know, for anyone listening out there, you know, it is about creating balance and ratios and making sure that to actually live a functionally sound and injury free life, you've got to pay the attention to the details early on or, you know, again, as soon as you possibly can to make sure you're not going to lay yourself up and get turned back from where you're, you know, the progress you're currently on as soon as possible. Yeah. So, with that said, how do we start? We start with very, very basic um, exercises that target these movement groups specifically. Okay, so the basic um, drills and exercises that you'll be doing <clears throat> when you first start are going to be things like push-ups for your push exercise. That's pretty uh, self-explanatory, I think. And uh, inverted rows, which are the push-up of pull exercises there like upside down uh, push-ups where you're, you're hanging under a bar and you're uh, it, but in the plank position so your legs are in front of you and you're not, not like a pull-up where you're completely hanging from quite high obviously. So horizontal press and pull essentially. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry, my explanation was terrible. <laughs> no, I liked your explanation. I thought it was good. It gave, it gave a lot of detail. I'm just uh, being the smart ass with the, uh, the kind of streamlined version. Thanks, man. Yeah. I appreciate it, genuinely. <laughs> no, I do, I do. <laughs> so, so they're the two, basically. That is where you're going to start. And uh, they're great because it's not just one exercise. There are variations of push-up you can do ad infinitum. And rows, although they're a bit more limited, you can still do things. You can work on one-arm rows, 
before you work on one arm pull-ups and uh, you'll that is the starting progression for it okay pretty pretty simple really I think with those two and uh, when yeah so the next stage after those because undoubtedly a lot of you aren't going to struggle with push-ups or inverted rows what you're going to be doing uh, is moving on to dips and pull-ups and when, when you're doing any of these four exercises it's very very important to you uh, maintain a good uh, movement and maintain good range of motion yeah you've got to go from the top all the way fully extended arm straight to right down to the ground with your push-up like get your chest right down there you with your back nice and straight don't dip or sag anywhere and then return to that position it's the same with the rows you start fully extended pull right up to the bar so your chest is right there elbows nicely behind you and then you come all the way back down and then finally disengage your shoulders if you're not doing that then you're you're not getting the benefit the full benefit of these movements you're not working every muscle to its max and you're, you're not working your joints and your mobility in the same way by t staying too stiff as you would if you moved and I, like I, I say move so many times and I'm sorry for that but that's it's so important that you're thinking about the movement and not just going 20 yeah it's not it's not about that <laughs> it's not about that it's not about how fast you can do it how you know it's about keeping it nice and slow not not and I mean I don't mean slow I mean just maintaining a good pace steady and controlled but so that you're feeling each movement. That means the up and the down of the movement is not just up, up, or push, push, or pull, pull. It's pull and return. It's, it's lower and push. You know, there, there's two parts of the movement and you need to be doing both parts. Make sure you're working both parts. And you get, it's, it's two reps, you know what I mean? Compared to someone who's doing 20, yeah, you're you're getting a much greater benefit from that than than the other guy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's trying to go for, for quality over quantity, isn't it? I mean, quantity can come in time, but you know, I'd rather in, with anyone that I'm coaching, I'd rather do far less in terms of number of repetitions. You know, far less quantity and really focusing on the quality. You know, make sure that people understand what they're doing, understand the nature of the movement. You know, don't just say do this move because it will build your chest, you know, understand what's going on, feel the muscles in your body, feel the joints that are moving, feel the entire experience of it because that builds a really strong neural connection as well, which is, you know, immensely powerful for when it comes to, you know, developing coordination and long-term strength around any particular movement pattern. So really think into what you're actually doing, slow things down, you know, it doesn't have to be crazy slow, you know, you can do tempo stuff as a variable you can do you know slower based movements to build strength you know so less reps and just more time under tension but you know in the early stages of anything you know if you're starting out from scratch and i imagine if you're listening to this there's a good chance you're not necessarily a complete beginner to training but it's really good to understand the fundamentals you know like any sort of discipline um you know for example i do martial arts we always go back to our basic forms you know because everything is built from that foundation so you know if you can't do basic form one you know, really, really well, almost with your eyes closed, with complete and utter coordination, you know, feeling the whole thing, then everything else above that is kind of superfluous because you're not really getting your stances correct, you know, you're not feeling every movement the way you should be. It's always good to regress back every now and then to kind of tune back into what you're doing. So even if you're an experienced um, lifter, experienced gymnast, you know, calisthenics guy, body weight expert, whatever you want to be, then as long as you're taking the time to when you're still doing your press ups, you know, your really basic drills, you're still feeling into the movement because there may be something else there that you've not quite learned yet, something else you've not quite attuned to. The body's always developing, it's always evolving, it's always growing. And it's always good to kind of keep, if nothing else, solidifying those connections all the time, you know, really kind of building that deep neural pathway through everything that you're doing to make sure you're kind of fully attuned at all times. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, even if you you're not necess um, like your muscles uh, in aren't growing from doing a rep like a, a push up, 
then it doesn't mean that there isn't a benefit in doing it because it's still working. Your mobility is still putting stress on your joints and it's still, like I say, building this connection, which is so important. And it takes a lot, lot longer to build up your neural connection than it does just to build a bit of size or even your joints. You know what I mean? It's, it's even, it takes even longer than repairing um, your, your uh, joint tissue compared to muscles. So your muscles will grow a lot faster than you're gonna be able to build coordination and stuff. But that skill is specifically transfers onto our next movement type, the isometrics, our hold exercises. Yeah, so <clears throat> if you don't have a good degree of uh, control and coordination of your body, you're gonna really struggle when it comes to holding your body in space completely solid especially when you need to breathe as well. But we won't talk about that right now. Isometric exercises are literally just holding yourself in that position. So you've got things like an L-sit and uh, or a hang in L, which is easier. You can do isometrics where you hold just the top of a push-up or the bottom of a push-up or the top of a pull-up or something like that. But there are plenty of specific skills with calisthenics that you can do for isometric training. And most of them, come from variations of uh, harder exercises that you're just using as a, a form of progression to build up to uh, levers or other power moves and stuff. So it's really, it's really important not just to think about these push and pull, but to work on your holds as well. Yeah, because that will have the added benefit of massively boosting this uh, mind-muscle connection, this neural connection to your, to your muscles, making you super strong for a start but also giving you a much bigger, uh, sorry, a much greater degree of control over individual parts of your body because you can't avoid feeling them when you're holding them and shaking like a, like a, um, a shaky thing. <laughs> yeah, well, like we were talking about before we actually started recording today, I started, I've started integrating uh, L-sit pull-ups into my program this month, and it's something I've only very much paid lip service to in the past you know the odd kind of rep here and there just to test them out and I, I did some some more serious work with them yesterday uh four sets of failure and essentially a little sit pull up for those of you that don't know what i mean is essentially performing a pull up you know, a vertical pull with your legs up in front of you in a straight line so essentially you're in an l position and you're performing the pull up through while maintaining that position and First and foremost, my abs were, and what they were at the time, screaming at me. My core, deeper core muscles were really kind of fired up as a result of having to hold my legs out. My thighs and hamstrings and everything were kind of starting to really scream at me by the end because I was keeping my legs out straight in front of me, which is a huge challenge. And, you know, I, I was feeling so much going on in that, you know, much more than beyond just a normal pull-up. You know, obviously, if you're starting out with pull-ups for the first time, you're going to feel a lot of different things going on as you know, new muscles or you know muscles that are already there but ones you haven't used that much before whether to stabilize or to actually concentrically or eccentrically contract to move you through you're going to feel new things going on and that's great and it's why it's always good to progress and try different things and test yourselves in different ways because yesterday my god my whole body was talking to me well it was it was shouting at me rather loud and um, profusely but uh, it was it was having its say and it was great you know it's fantastic because you know just learning to move while holding isometrically in certain positions as well it was a, a real education in just what my body is capable of but also what it's not quite capable of yet but also where it can go in time and before we move on uh, i'll just carry on, on this sort of isometric stuff do you mind if we just regress back a little bit to the the press and pull stuff because there's just a couple of things i wanted to comment on before we got too far into the other stuff is that cool yeah, no, no. I think, um, to be honest with you, there's not much more to be said for isometrics. It's, it's compared to the movements. This is almost like a. Th it, it can be considered as like a throwaway thing because you're going to be hold if you're not holding your body tight and you're not doing exercises for holds really, like you're going to be doing them in the rep in in one way or another. But it's important just to know about these isometrics so that when we refer to them later, because we definitely will people know what we're talking about and people can apply it to their own. But yeah, circle back round, cushion cool. and pull in. These are the actual movements, obviously, as mm. opposed to holding, which is debatable. I, I call it movement still because I, I feel it, it is, even though you know what I'm saying. Well, I'm yeah, it's, it, it's still part of the you know full spectrum of, of human 
activity, you know, holding a position, you know, can, is just as intense, if not more intense in a lot of cases than actually actively dynamically moving it yeah. has relevance. So it's part of it. Like we say, we can break movement down very simplistically to three components. You know, we have concentric contraction, isometric contraction and, and eccentric contraction. So you know, concentric contraction is the more sort of active part of a movement. So for example, in a press up, you know, your concentric contraction would be the push up, you know, as the muscles you're directly targeting, you know, triceps, chest, deltoids, anterior deltoids specifically are concentrically contracting, they're actively contracting to push force away from the body, to so push you up off the floor. An isometric position would, as we've just said, explain the position that you're holding at the bottom. So when you get down into the press, if you just pause there for a second, two, three, however many seconds you like, just holding as those all those muscles are counterbalancing the muscles at the back of your body, the muscles at the front of the body are just holding together in a really strong balanced ratio to kind of just hold you into that position. So, you know, there's a lot going on there very, very actively and hence why it's obviously that much more challenging because a lot of muscle and a lot of neural activity is being fired up in that moment. And then the eccentric part of a press-up position or press-up movement would be the lowering phase. So it's as the muscles that would normally push you back up the floor start to relax, start to ease a little bit, and the other muscles around the so biceps, your back muscles, you know, posterior deltoids are starting to actually actively contract and tighten just that little bit as the concentric, more um, what we call agonist movers. So you have agonists and antagonists. I'll get into that another point, but essentially those muscles are tightening to just lo allow you lower you to the floor effectively. So always remember that concentric, eccentric and isometric, you know, so those are kind of the primary contractions going on in the body through any given activity. So yes, isometrics is obviously a very important part of movement. Hopefully that explains that in a bit more of a scientific way. <laughs> yeah, but no. uh, yeah, going back to the, um, the press pull stuff, you know, in terms of whether you're a beginner or not, it's always good to understand, you know, that obviously a horizontal press, a horizontal pull is always going to be easier than a vertical press or a vertical pull. As soon as the hands or the position moves further away from the center of the body, so, you know, pushing yourself off the floor as opposed, you know, in a horizontal position, so you're laying practically parallel to the floor versus doing a handstand press up where you're completely vertical, obviously that's going to be that much harder. So, and any gradient within that where your legs come higher up and obviously the angle of the body changes to become a more vertical position is going to be tougher. Likewise, if you want to regress a pressing movement or a pulling movement, you start to elevate the hands higher up. So in a press up position, if you wanted to make them easier or you want to focus in more on technique rather than on intensity, then put the hands higher up, you know, do a press off a box, off a table, off a window ledge, you know, something that's going to allow you to really focus in on the technique. Think about your postural position because that's something where people get, you know, quite messed up in press ups, you know, they start mm. to kind of almost snake up off the floor you know it becomes like a cobra position in yoga where you start to lift the chest but the core muscles your bum the hips. stays the same place <laughs> exactly yeah, your bum stays on the floor and i've seen that recently with the uh, the press-up challenge that's been going around that both you and i have done you see people doing these press-ups and you almost want to kind of scream through the screen at them lift your bum stick your ass up in the air you know mm. because while to you it may feel like you're really poking your bum up in the air and you're kind of you know almost like a downward dog position you know with your bum up in a very sort of upside down v shape actually you'll be neutral because and what feels normal what feels quite neutral to you is actually sagging down quite a lot whether you don't quite have the core strength or the core endurance in particular there to see you all the way through the movement effectively without arching and obviously that's going to compress a lot around your lower back you know make your lower spine lower back muscles very tight and very painful and uncomfortable in time and it's also going to change the dynamic of the movement through the shoulders so just mm. be conscious of that and if you find yourself, you know, it's always a good idea. What I do a lot of the time when I'm training on my own is I film myself doing things. So I've always got that point of reference back so I can check that I'm doing things correctly. And I do think it, you don't have to do it for every set, every rep, but it's also valuable, I think, from time to time, especially when you're getting to the latter stage of the exercise, i.e. the last few sets or the last few reps of something to kind of really hone in and see what is my body doing when it's tired? You know, what is it doing when it's fatiguing? And just get that feedback loop constantly going so you're always trying to assess and become your own coach over time so yeah always think with the press up look at technique bring the hands up that little bit higher likewise with the uh, the pulling work as reese said you can do single arm work on the on the uh, horizontal pull on the trx on the inverted rows laying underneath the bar pulling your chest up to it to help progress yourself up to doing the vertical pulls and obviously focusing on range of motion at all time the other thing we talked about was the dips 
you know, dips are something that's so important. You know, all of this is important to have a good, strong um, mobility practice based around them. You know, make sure you're warming up the shoulders appropriately, warming up the spine, getting yourself fully prepped for the movement. But dips more than anything else because of the extension of the shoulder, you know, because the way that your elbows are driving back up behind you and you're really stretching mm. out of the front of the shoulder, you know, that's something that you really need to work on with your mobilization. So even something as simple as standing with a broom or just any sort of stick behind your back with your hands almost in a position as if they were going to curl up into a bicep curl and bring the weight forward, but obviously the bar is behind you, it's behind your bum, so you're not going to be able to do that. But try and lift your arms up behind you, okay? So you're going to start to feel that stretch and extension through the shoulder very actively and if you can't bring that up pretty much to parallel i.e about a 90 degree angle behind you without having to lean your body forward excessively there's a good argument to say that you shouldn't be doing dips if you don't have that strength and that flexibility to extend the shoulder just by lifting a broom handle up behind you with straight arms and obviously fit, coping with that stretch without having to massively compensate by leaning forward then when you go into a loaded position like a dip where you're putting all your body weight, all the tension of that through the front of the shoulder, then as I say, there's a good call to say you should probably back off. You know, if you don't have the movement, if you don't have the mobilization, uh, the mobility capacity there, then there's a good chance that it's gonna go wrong when you start to load more pressure, more intensity onto the movement itself. So just be conscious of that. Is yeah. that fair? Yeah, but the one good thing is you can stretch for that as well. It's not like, oh, I can't lift my hands very much, that's it, i never be able to do dips. Mm. It's not the case. Your no. mobility and flexibility can improve always, always. So an easy way to do a stretch like that would be to, if you have like a little bar or something or some railings around the gym or around your home or around down the park or anything, you can just put your hands on there in a standard position so they're like kind of by your hips or just behind your back. And then you slowly lower yourself to the ground uh, with your arms straight and that'll just slowly bring those shoulders back in that position. And it doesn't matter if your your back will round up a bit and as you get right down into the squat, but that'll help you build that mobility as well. So a combination of doing that stretch and f flexibility exercise with um, push-ups will help you build up the strength in that um, and the range of motion to then progress onto dips. And once, when you work in that flexibility as well, another great thing you can do, if you have the strength there already, is not say, I can't do dips until I can do this, um, but it's just to, once you have a degree of that mobility, you can start doing uh, very small uh, movement reps of the dip. So you start at the top and you come down less than 90 degrees, but just slowly work in that. So you're working your scapula, stabilizers, you're working your, your, all your uh, shoulder muscles and your chest, and you're just getting used to that movement. So as your mobility increases and your strength increases, you'll be able to get lower and lower and lower until you can touch your hands with your shoulders. And uh, then you can do some pretty cool dips. Yeah, and there's always, you know, dips likewise with pull-ups. You know, as, as Reese has said, we don't want to say that you shouldn't try something if you're feeling like you want to give it a go. You know, there, there is an argument always that, you know, at some degree of partial range movement, just to get used to, you know, holding yourself off the floor in a particular position, whether it's, you know, up against a bar for a pull-up or, you know, for a frame for some dips. You know, there are other means by which to do that. So, for example, you can do negatives. So, you know, a great thing there, you know, is essentially really focusing on what we talked about before the eccentric contraction. So with a pull up, that would be just getting yourself to the top of the bar and just lowering yourself down very, very slowly. You know, so just getting used to being able to hold your body off the floor for an extended period of time through a particular movement. You haven't got to go for the pull back up. Just step yourself up onto a bench, jump to the top of the bar and then lower back down again. Likewise, with dips, you know, get yourself to the top of the movement slowly lower yourself down if you start to feel at any point that you're going to lose the position or there's any sort of un undue pain in the shoulder then just put your feet back on the frame you know out to the side wherever it is that you know you, you yeah, started yeah. your feet from just step down yeah exactly step down you know just relax out but just get used to lowering so negatives are a great way of developing strength through particularly complex or you know slightly more advanced movement patterns and again you can use that with pull you know horizontal pulls and presses is tends to be less necessity to do it and equally with the pulls and the dips, you can use bands as well. You know, use um, lifting bands, power bands, and uh, you know, strap them around the equipment. So you're basically resting your knee into a band, either hanging from the top of a frame for pull-ups, or maybe just across some bars 
either side of the dip bar. So you're just kneeling on something that's actually helping you with the resistance. So it's gonna help you to push back up, just remove some of the pressure initially through the shoulders. And you can go for lighter bands progressively over time. And if you don't know what we mean by bands or what that sort of looks like, if you've never heard of that idea before, then feel free to reach out to us. We'll give you some more information about how to get in touch at the end of the episode and I'll happily point you in the right direction for that. But yeah, I think that's most of what I wanted to say about those fundamental upper body yeah. and, and hold positions. Anything you want to add into the mix or should we go on to talking a bit about leg work? Um, one, one thing just before we go on to the legs and that's your core. And now because the thing about your core is because it's the middle of your body, you don't really push or pull from it. So all the, all of your core, although you'll get the back of your, your back, your obliques, your lats, you know, your, and your, your abs will be working all the time when you're doing uh, pulls, dips, and isometrics, they'll always be in the mix somewhere, but they're not being concentrated on. So to work your core there, you can do um, things like leg raises, whether you're hanging or supporting on top of like uh, the dipping bars, you can bring your legs up into your body to then repeat your core. And it's like doing crunches, but instead of just moving your back up to your knees, what you're doing is you're, you're levering with your hips. So you're using all of your core and your hip flexors, which is the problem with that the world has with crunches. You just work in your abs and just you're basically just ruining that part of your back and your hips aren't moving at all really. So uh, it, uh, there's a very limited mobility in there. But with the leg raises, because you're in a hanging position, it forces your whole body then to work that part because you have no uh, support. You're not lying down. You, you're, you're not sitting down on anything. You know, it forces all, the, all your trunk muscles to work together and properly to then build serious core strength. <clears throat> so hanging, supported leg raises. And another one that I love doing is that we, we get onto hollow, hollow body work if you want, but I really just wanted to touch on this quick, are these flutter kicks, which I did mention to you earlier, Chris, Yeah. <coughs> before we hit record. And these are, you're just lying on the ground or on a bench, which I prefer. And uh, where you just do like, uh, you just raise your legs up above your, uh, above your hips and back down like a 90 degree kind of core exercise. Instead, you just bring in the legs just above or holding them horizontally if you're, uh, if you're on a bench with your legs straight, just kicking, kicking like, uh, like you would if you were in a swimming pool and just fluttering your legs like that uh, for time. And I tell you, that will rip your core up so much, you'll be crying. And uh, yeah, yeah, and am amazing, amazing exercise for, for the whole of your trunk, not just getting a six pack, because it's not all about it. No, exactly. And in one of our previous talks on my podcast, you know, we got into the, the dynamics of core musculature and we'll continue to talk about that, you know, longer term, you know, over other episodes, you know, there's so much going on around the core. It's not just abs, you know, it really is everything from the, essentially the lower ribs all the way down to the top of the thighs. You know, there's so much going on around that position. So when we talk about anything that's challenging your core, it's very much that lumbar pelvic region, you know, it's the lower back all the way down through to your pelvis, to your pelvic floor muscles, you know, so... Yeah. There's a hell of a lot going on through that that area, so you know never neglect it, so to speak. You know, there's always going to be a challenge to it placed on it by any sort of really intense dynamic exercise, like a pull up, even a press up. You know, depending on how strong you are. But obviously, as you progress through, you know, the limiting factor in a lot of things is going to be your ability to stabilize, particularly through that area. So, yeah. you know, core has been popularized as a term over the years now, and it's become a bit of a, a fatty idea, and everyone wants to have good core. But, you know, most people don't fully understand what that really means. So as, yeah. as Reese has just pointed out, you know, it's such an essential part of your body. You know, so much is going through that at any given time. So it's something that, you know, you really do need to pay a lot of extra attention to over time. Everything, every movement is essentially a core exercise because everything is going to hit the core. But equally, it's very important to do accessory work, you know, that's going to help you to really focusing on how to optimize that and also learn how to brace it correctly mm. through certain movement patterns and also to prepare for bigger moves before you actually start to attempt them and even do some sort of active warm-up for your core muscles as well to make sure those very strong stabilizing muscles are firing up before you even attempt anything too complex because you've already got then the foundation not train them to fatigue you don't want them to be overly tired because they're not going to then perform but just warming them up appropriately it's something that doesn't probably get really discussed as much when we talk about warm-ups everyone thinks you know heat up the joints, stretch out the muscles, but you know, stability work as part of a warm up. you know, that's, yeah. 
that's huge. You know, even just doing a few press ups just to kind of get your body, get your core muscles fired up, holding your body off the floor for a few reps. You know, that can yeah. be really, really valuable when you progress up to more complex things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's really important to work your core. And listen, like we'll, we'll set up a. Um, I've got already got a, like a getting started page that goes through a lot of these exercises, which you can check out, and we'll 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 set up a link to that or something, because uh, I know we're just throwing a lot at you right now, but um, they can take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You probably know a lot of these exercises anyway. It's just good to uh, to to go through them and how they work and what you're doing, so that you can apply that philosophy to other stuff you're doing as well, not just think about pull ups and dips. Yeah, sounds All right. good. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, so let's move on to legs then. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially, when it comes to you know body weight drills, obviously everything you do in a gym setting with some sort of external loading, like a dumbbell or a barbell, you can, you can perform. You can do a body weight squat. You can do a bridging movement. You know, lifting the laying on your back, lifting your hips up off the floor. You know, a hip hinge essentially um, to try and f- f- target in on, uh, glutes and hamstrings and the posterior elements of the legs. You can lunge, you can step up, you can do a single leg deadlift, just balancing on one leg, tilting the body forward, uh, bringing the other leg up behind you. Um, but it's very hard to progress past a certain point with those things. So a lot of the time with leg work specifically, it does tend to require some external loading to, to progress on more strength. However, there are examples and my f- personal favorite of, a body weight drill this is exceptionally challenging you know no matter how much you progress because it's very hard to build the volume in over time just because of the coordination and complexity and this is where skill and strength you know really start to cross over is doing a pistol squat yeah. so which is essentially a single leg squat so just going down on one leg arse to grass all the way to the floor or progressively you know getting used to doing it to a bench or a box or a chair and then down to a lower level like a rebox step or you know just a lower smaller box or stool and then getting yourself all the way down to the floor and being able to comfortably lift yourself back up. So that's a, a really great example of a body weight leg position, which is going to hit your legs almost as hard, if not harder, than doing you know a very heavy loaded squat or deadlift through you know using both feet at the same time. And in a lot of people's cases, with you know negligible form, you know we see a lot of very partial range work going on, particularly with squats. You know. A lot of people seem to neglect the necessity of trying to get the thighs parallel or even below parallel to the floor, you know, getting the hips lower than the knees and really driving that range of motion. So, you know, you can start off with all the other stuff, you know, lunges, step ups, they're all great. You know, these are all great exercises to try and challenge you. And like we said before, with the upper body stuff, you can change the tempo around. So just go slower. You can go down and hold positions as well. So step into a lunge and hold it at the bottom, you know, just keeping your back knee ever so slightly off the floor. So you are putting all the tension through the legs, you know, that stuff's really, really important as well. Equally with the pistol squats, you know, holding those at the bottom before you drive back up is going to be a great way of building strength. So there is a ton of stuff you can do if you're creative with it, if you kind of play around with the volumes, play around with the intensities, play around with the time. You know, there's a number of different ways to hit your legs without actually adding any external weight to it whatsoever. But from my perspective, I'm always going to come from a place where I like adding external load because I find that also an equally good test as well. The, the point is you can do a lot of things, you know, regardless of what the resources you have available. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, mo- most people, when they do get to training, they do just think about squats as a, as a leg exercise. And I think the important thing to kind of understand is that in actual movement in real life, not in the gym, the majority of um, force that your legs exert is pushing. You're not really doing pull movements with your legs because you can't really grip anything to bring it in in the first place. And that's not to say that your muscles can't. You ha- you've got your uh, your hamstrings, obviously, and and they do work, and your hip flexors, of course, as well. But it's as a as a main focus, your legs are predominantly pushing, which is why. There, there isn't much beyond like squats and lunges as basic framework exercises that you you can do f- to train your legs. You do have like rotary exercises and ways of ad- tweaking those basic two kind of movements, and uh, that is limiting. I know, sorry, Chris, <laughs> it is limiting. But I, I, there isn't a lot more you can you can do with your legs, is there? It's just it's just the way it is. Well, I would say in terms of balance, you know, you, again, another reason why I love the pistol squat is, you know, especially when you're starting out with it, getting yourself into a position 
you know, where you can lower yourself to the floor. I mean, that is all um, flexion of the knee. Yeah. So that is all coming through the hamstrings and the glutes. You know, that eccentric lowering phase. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not putting it. I'm not putting it to shame at all. No, no, I'm no. Like, but I'm, I'm, saying, saying, the I'm just force, saying there's... the main concentration of your pistol squat is pushing back up, isn't it? It's not going Oh yeah, down. I mean that that's the harder part of the movement, but also that's just the way the muscles are balanced. You know, yeah. the facet and tonic muscle balance. You know, those tonic muscles, the ones that are kind of at the back of the body that are going to, you know, stay fairly strong anyway because they're the ones that are holding you up. And maybe yeah. that's something we should have mentioned earlier. You know, there are the, the muscles in your back more often than not are you know you're typically able to pull, particularly you know horizontally, able to pull more than you can push. Hmm. Because that's just the way the body's built because those muscles at the back are designed to be strong because they're the ones that are holding you in an upright position all day long anyway. So yeah, yeah so lowering tends to be more skill based in a pistol yeah, squat. Yeah. Than Which it does just highlights the importance of doing it slowly as well. Yes. And what like you say, with a pistol squat, when you first come to it <clears throat> and if you already have a good range of motion in your regular squat or like a body weight squat, then you'll uh, you won't have a problem being in the bottom position of a pistol squat, mm. but getting down to it is really hard. It's a high. It takes a very, very high degree of balance and coordination. You need to have your leg out nicely in front of you. You need to put your arms out in front of you as well. And you need to keep your whole body balanced over that one foot. There's no leaning out to one side or anything with a pistol squat. You'll literally just fall over, and it'd be a total waste. That is that's so important. And when you do pistol squats as well, always don't think of pushing with your toes. Like with an, a, a normal squat, drive in with your heels. Yeah, because that is the, the, the point where the rest of your body, that your rest of your body is going to move around. Yeah, your heel. So push straight into the ground with your heel and that's going to help a lot when it comes to maintaining balance, getting back up as well as getting down, like really focus on heel position and don't be up on your toes. It's a mistake I see so many people make with pistol squats and squats in general. And it's uh, it's like, that's such a, that's so, such a fundamental technique. It's really important to highlight that to you guys now. Yeah, definitely. As soon as that heel lifts off the floor, um, you know, and it's, it's more sort of mid foot to heel. Um, you know, you don't have to, if you set back, obviously, completely onto your heel and have your toes up off the floor then you could be equally as well yeah you'll at the risk of falling backwards way. yeah exactly as, as you would be falling <laughs> forwards if all your weight's on your toes so try and keep an even balance you know it's a good practice to try and focus on pushing your big toe and your heel into the floor or you're pushing your toes and your heel into the floor at the same time yeah it's almost like you're gripping that. the ground with your foot exactly like you know, that's, that's where barefoot training toes. That, that's where barefoot training can become really valuable you know because you just get used to that feel of gripping with your feet because that's as natural a human thing to do as anything you know it's mm. just a grip as we walk over things as we move so with the the pistol squat as well there is you know i don't want you to think that you have to go straight into that there are progressions to it and a very simple progression to look at like with anything there's always a progression and in this case when you're doing a step up for example if that's the kind of level that you're at Really focus on pulling yourself up to the top of a step up, so with your foot up on a bench or box or something in front of you. Really focus on pulling yourself up, almost using your hamstrings and glutes to kind of lift you up off the floor rather than just sort of bouncing off the back foot. Then equally, as you come back down to the floor, again, squeeze those muscles. It's the same dynamic. You're yeah. lowering yourself. So squeeze the hamstrings, squeeze the glutes, you know, really focus in on those muscles and practice that coordination. Then from there, you can practice standing up on the box or the bench and then very simply just lowering with one leg, keep the other leg down to the side, but keep it straight and try and lower yourself until you can actually touch your heel comfortably to the floor mm. and then drive back up off the other leg. You know, that's yeah, when you start yeah. to build that practice. If you can't get all the way down to the floor, don't worry, just go half of the way and get to the point where you feel comfortable. And then you can start to practice maybe as you're squatting down to allow you to get lower, start lifting the foot from the floor. So just bringing that leg up a little bit higher so it starts to replicate more of a pistol squat where the leg's out in front of you at the bottom of the movement and then just pro pro and then just progress from there. So it's very, very straightforward. There's lots of ways of building yeah. to it. But again, it's really all of those things are really going to help you with that skill development and that strength and balance development of yeah. lowering yourself down. And that's a great starting point as well. That is actually fantastic because it's, you're probably doing some form of step up anyway or you do maybe you could do it on your stairs at home or... You know, there, there are loads of situations where you can do that to build that initial kind of uh, motor control and and strength and uh, trust in balance on one leg as well, because it's it's also kind of weird as well. If you haven't been doing anything like that in ages, 
it is a bit not uh, it's a bit not confusing but it's like a bit it's a bit offsetting for your mind and for your, for your for your brain to work out like what you're doing yeah exactly it's just that neural connection again you know yeah, it's just yeah. getting everything firing up in the right order so it doesn't feel quite so wobbly you know it's one of the things you'll always notice when you go from doing no training to some training you start off a little bit shaky and all of a sudden you start to be less shaky and then you progress and make things a bit harder and things get a bit shakier again yeah. and then you've reached that level where everything starts to stabilize and it's just you know over time building that that connectivity throughout the whole body and it's just mm. going to become much more confident and you just feel yeah i can just drop to do that yeah you know, absolutely there was a time when i couldn't I, I wouldn't even hope to do a pistol squat and now you know i kind of do it almost as you know automatically when i sit down onto the floor you know i lowered myself down on one leg do you pistol that's what out my body... as well when you're sitting on the floor do you pistol out into standing yeah i, I did actually <laughs> I no, I guess. Well. <laughs> it's funny when i'm training people though i'll demonstrate an exercise to them and that's on the floor and i'll lower myself down off one leg and stand back up off one leg and they're like oh my god how do you do that you know and do i have to do that and like, no, no 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 it's fine like <laughs> we will do that of course if we haven't done it already because i like to teach people that particular drill but you know you do it it's not because you're showing off and look at me i can go up and down on one leg it's just because it feels quite comfortable yeah. Likewise, a lot of the time now, if I lean forward to pick something up, because I've spent so much time doing single leg deadlifts, I tend to just hinge at the hip and just sort of bend down and pick it up off the floor without actually bending my knees. You know, because... Yeah, I do that as well. I just like fold in half and uh, <laughs> grab something yeah. off the floor. <laughs> but it's great, you know, because it, that's natural. It feels normal to do that now because you've trained your body to do it. So it's mm. amazing how quickly, over, you know, and progressively over time as well. But, you know things that would otherwise seem really freaky and alien suddenly become natural because yeah. guess what it's actually a natural movement it's something that's there your body wants to move that way we've just forgotten how <laughs> and that kind of i think probably brings us full circle really isn't it yeah. to what, how we started this which is you know most things in fact everything that we're talking about here it's all natural movement whether it's with a dumbbell a barbell or just with your body weight you know it's it's more than lifting because it's natural human movement you know we don't need to categorize it as lifting because this is fundamentally correct functional natural movement and obviously that's what this show is all about yeah yeah and there, there is more to it than, than lifting as well it is mobility it is flexibility it is uh, these isometrics and these um compound movements you know it is a, there, there's more to it than just throwing a dumbbell around and that, i think that's important to to remind yourself of that as well exactly. because Otherwise, you'll get stuck in that mentality where you're constantly looking at weight, size, 15 kilos, 17 and a half kilos, 20 kilos, you know, and it's, <clears throat> that's such a limiting way of uh, watching yourself develop because there's so much more to it. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, how do you quantify a handstand as a weight discipline? You can't really. No, exactly. I mean, there's, there's tons to it. It's skill, it's strength, it's stability. It's... Yeah flexibility mobility you know the good movements the big sort of larger compound more complex things there's so much going on in them you yeah know? yeah you know it's not it's not to dismiss you know simpler isometric stuff like bicep curls and things like that because it can be complementary to bigger movements and yeah yeah you know, and it can be fun as well sometimes well, exactly. it is nice just to do some uh dumbbell uh, you know a couple of weights grab a weight and just be like yeah you know what this calisthenics thing's doing me all right. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And it's, you know, a lot, it's, as long as you see that stuff as, you know, what it is, it's kind of accessory work. You know, you want to spend 90% really of your time, 95% even, doing the complex stuff, doing the things that are going to give you the greatest gains, the most bang for your buck, you know, give you the highest returns, be the ones that you can really measure progress on significantly. I mean, I don't think I've ever paid attention to how much I can bicep curl. Like, I couldn't tell you what I used to curl when I was a kid. I couldn't tell you what I can curl now, it's just something I'll pick up, normally because it's something I'm doing at the end of a session, very rarely, you know, don't ever be the guy that just walks straight into the gym and starts doing bicep curls, you know, yeah, don't yeah. ever be that guy because... You're better than that, man. It's such a waste, you're just losing so much, you see it happen, they'll go on and they'll smash out their biceps and then go and try and do some pull-ups, you know, they'll knock out like three or four pull-ups and yeah. they're really awful form because it's like, oh, well, lo and behold, you've pre-fatigued the weakest element of the, the pull-up, you know, yeah. the smallest <laughs> muscle you're using, the bicep. You know, but you which is the, the, the start the of the movement for a, for, for a pull as well the biceps that first bit that gets in you bring your back in properly afterwards when you get your elbows behind you and you get right up to the bar so exactly. it's like you're, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure yeah and look those things can you know, again have another part when you're injured as well I've had times when I've had shoulder injuries and I've not been able to do any pressing or, or pulling compound yeah. wise you know horizontally vertically or otherwise but I wanted to maintain some work 
So I've gone and done lots of isolation work with my arms, bicep curls, tricep, uh, push downs, extensions there, you know, just stuff that I know I can do to try and keep some degree of um, strength and coordination and, and yeah. neural activity going on through my upper body. You know, I just had to be patient, but I can do those things, you know, so they can work. Yeah, but I do think it's secondary. I think it's secondary to your shoulders and your, 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 your trunk and your torso because, like, without your shoulders, your, your elbows would be completely useless and so your arms would be completely useless. So I think um, your, your, these kind of bigger joints, your hips and your shoulders kind of come and your whole trunk and your core come uh, uh, often neglected but are much more important to your fundamental movement than, than, your, uh, than your elbow or your, your, el or your arm lever, do you know what I mean? Um, that's what I mean by my elbow, I mean your biceps and your triceps and your forearm. And like it's not neglect. It's not about neglecting them either. But it's about not just being obsessed with your arms. Brilliant. I think that's actually quite a good note to wrap it up on. What do you reckon? I don't know if you want to add anything into the mix, mate. Um, no, no, not really. No. Um, we'll we'll set up um, a page in the notes that has more details on all these exercises or some kind of pathway, so you can find out more information, get visual. Uh, explanations, videos, or images, and walkthroughs of the, these, so you can get started with it. I've got um, a foundation workout which covers most of these exercises anyway, as a total body workout. You can just download it off the website. Um, yeah, and that's 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 about it, really, mate. This is uh, this is like the start of your training. You know, these are your first couple of exercises. You'll start learning. You'll start working on. These are fundamentals. Whenever I do workouts, these are the exercises I'm doing for strength. I'm not doing like crazy exercises. You think this is like too basic. Like I do 30 pull-ups a day, 30 dips a day, 30 leg raises a day. You know, it's, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't think I'm above this. You're not above it. You can start now and you'll get massive benefits from, from doing these, these fundamental movements. Cool. Okay, guys. Well, look, you know, thank you very much for joining us today. If you liked what you've heard, then please do head on over to iTunes to leave a rating and review to help other people find the show. It can be a little bit of good karma for yourself as well, and we will be very, very grateful. We won't turn up and, you know, hug you or kiss you or anything. We don't know who you are. It's all very anonymous, but thank you in advance for your support. If you would like to get involved in the show in any way, whether it's to come on and maybe have a chat with us, to share a question or get something answered by us that you'd be intrigued by, then please do feel to reach out to us via our individual websites at morethanlifting.com for Reese, coachthatch.com for myself, or come and message us on social. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Coach Thatch and More Than Lifting. But anyway, that will do us today. Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. Um, don't forget to subscribe, leave us a rating, and um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll catch up with you soon. We've got loads of new stuff coming, and it's, uh, it's, we've got some great stuff actually coming over the next few episodes that we touch on endurance, training, skills training, mindset, and, uh, and nutrition before we get into all our crazy little experiments.